Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. All right. I think I got all that off my chest. What I do want to tell you as we go into the message here is I believe that God has put this message on my heart for a reason. And and the only reason I can say is that somebody out there, whether you're here or you're online, Um, Somebody needs to hear this, or I just need to tell it. Um, But as the week progressed, uh, so this message is, I've been working on this message for our next race in August, where I'll be um, serving as chaplain. And, um, you know, the week was progressing, and, you know, obviously in touch with Nick, and um, I I said to Bobby about midweek, it's like, I don't see the signs and symptoms of the concussion going away real fast. And uh, I'm not sure he's going to be able to do this on Sunday. And so I was, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking also about Kanoi as I was working on this message. And then yesterday morning, I'm an early riser I got up and um, God clearly spoke to me in my spirit and just said, you need to finish that message now for Kanoi. And um, it was about uh, four or five hours later, probably maybe maybe a little more, that um, in talking with Nick, he said, can you do that? And I was already like, I can, and I think I should. Um, And so I want you to know that as we go into this. um, It has changed a lot from what I'm doing at the races with this content and to what you're going to hear this morning. So again, from from my perspective, um, somebody must really need this, or I just really need to tell it, because I'm also going to be sharing some things with you all personally, that I've not ever shared from front um, of a congregation before. So, let's dive in, but let me pray first, because I want this to be what God wants and not even what maybe is on my paper. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that you have given me in this to... um, deliver this message. And Lord, I, even as I've prepared it, I pray for your um, intervention and for your Holy Spirit to speak through me and speak to the ears that are hearing. And God, if there's anything here that's not from you, I pray that you would just shield it from anybody hearing it. God, we want to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so my title is, Why Does God Allow Pain? You ever wondered that? Have you ever felt like God was absent or forgot about you? Anybody? Have you ever felt like you got a raw deal of undeserved circumstances? Do you sometimes look at the condition of our world and wonder if God's power is even real? I'm going to tell you I can say yes to all three. And at times in a pretty big way. And let me just ask, are you bothered by the full page of the insert in your bulletin of cancer concerns? Do you ever feel like you have a target on your back? This is where I'm heading today. So um, I want you to, 
I want you to know that. We're going to dig deep into this, and it's not going to be a feel good, celebrate, let's, you know, everything's great kind of message. This is just going to be hard stuff, and I'm going to share some things that were hard. And I, I just, um, at the end, we will know and we will celebrate that God is still on the throne, no matter what. Okay? But I'm going to take you on this journey. This morning, I want you to look and understand that of the pain that will likely come with discipleship, and even perhaps why we go through the pain. Being a disciple, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. In fact, it would be my belief, in many ways, we get a target on our back when we say yes to Jesus. So in Acts 28.2, if you'd like to turn to that, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 1.4. But in Acts chapter 28 uh, is the story prior to that. The Apostle Paul was on a ship, gets shipwrecked, gets on an island, and I'm really abbreviating it here, but he finds himself with um, a bunch of sailors on this island, um, and he ends up meeting up with the natives of the island. And Acts 28, 2 says, The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us because it was raining and cold. So he goes through this storm, and someone is there to give him a fire, some warmth, and some food, even though they were frightened of him. And if you look at the story, he wasn't too sure about them either. Okay? And then in 2 Corinthians 1.4, this is Paul writing to the church, the Corinthian church, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So in that verse, he's saying, so in that time of need and the need of comfort, God has comforted me and I've received comfort for the purpose of giving comfort to somebody else when called upon. The perspective I want to speak from today is that of a victim, or the person like Paul in this passage, the one who gets the raw deal, the one caught in the crossfire, the good person who doesn't deserve the hand they were dealt, and yet they're even a disciple of Jesus, and they still get that hand dealt. For this morning, I'm not talking about pain caused by bad decisions, or um, but Instead, the pain that we get were from things we have no control over. And for this morning, I'm also not addressing pain caused by disobedience in our own life as well. So I want to, because I know this is a broad topic, and you know, depending on uh, your perspective. We could go down a path of like, this is, this is why, this is why, this is why, this is why. Did you think of this? I, I'm looking at a very narrow focus this morning, that of the person who is going through pain, not because they have sin in their life, not because they were disobedient, just because they're going through it and there's got to be something on the other end that um, God's going to use and God's allowing it. Paul is arguably the most important influential disciple of Jesus in history, and yet he was shipwrecked and stranded on the island with potential unfriendlies. We say this in the church, and as believers, we say, Lord, use me. Use me in whatever you want to use me in. Do you know what you're asking for when you say that? Do you really think you're prepared for what God may use you in? 
And I'm just curious, um, have you ever been told that as a disciple you will be heading into war? We don't think about that a whole lot. We like the feel-good type stuff. When you're a disciple of Christ, the enemy has his sights on you, and now you have a target on your back when you're a disciple of Christ. So I'm going to share, um, in, in 2004, I finished Bible College, Moody Bible Institute, and was ordained. My involvement in ministry ramped up, and more specifically in the evangelism side of ministry, seeking those from God and inviting, far from God, and inviting them to check out Jesus. Personally, I envisioned many people coming to Christ through my involvement in the ministry, and I felt equipped and ready for battle. I was ready to go. Put me in, coach. I can remember thinking, I don't know that I said it, but I do remember thinking it. Bring it on, Satan. I am a child of God, and I am in God's army with his protection. Bring it on. I was not prepared for what was in store for me in the coming years. And I'm get, this is the part that I've not ever shared before, but I'm going to share a chain of events in my life. And there could be a sermon or two in each of these events. We're not going there. I'm just going to name the events and, and the sequence of them. So I'm starting at, you know, up after getting ordained, being heavily involved in ministry. We were heavily involved as, a, as volunteers in our church. I was uh, chairman of the leadership team, small group leader. Bobby and I were youth directors. And I was away several weekends doing ministry at the racetrack. I felt like I was all in. I mean, there was not a minute in my week that was not occupied with something. But I wanted to be all in. And for the sake of understanding this timeline, you also need to know I was still also a volunteer paramedic at Northwest EMS here in Elizabethtown. So that's 2004. You understand where we're starting. In 2005, um, my pastor at the time was diagnosed with a rare cancer and died in 2006. I was asked by the, the Brethren in Christ denomination to serve as the interim pastor of this church until they found a new pastor, and I accepted. So I was all in more, right? Understand my perspective, like I, I'm giving it all, God. In 2007, after new pastor was found and hired, and a little bit of time was passed. Um, the denomination asked me to leave that church um, so that the new pastor could completely uh, plant his leadership foundation. Makes sense to me now, looking back, but at the time I was devastated. And this seemed to be the beginning of a period of real darkness for me. Um, you probably wouldn't have known it on the outside, um, but inside it was starting to get dark. In June 2008, so you're getting the years, right? We're, we're just going down through. My mother died suddenly of a pulmonary embolism. She had just put the check in the mail as a deposit for their 50th anniversary cruise and um, collapsed in the house. I was the first one there and did CPR on my mom as my dad stood there in shock. I was unprepared. 2008, in the third quarter, the housing industry crashed. You all probably remember that. And it took our business with it. Our business dropped 60% in three months. I was unprepared. In January 2009, 
my son's girlfriend, now my daughter-in-law, is in a serious car accident on a Sunday morning, and Bobby and I are the first providers on the scene, and I crawl in the back window and take care of her all the way to the hospital, even after when help came. They just had me stay there. That happened to be the morning that my son was to be installed as youth pastor at Ebic. None of us made it. In May 2009, my daughter's boyfriend, now my son-in-law, fell and broke his neck, paralyzed. I was in a board meeting of Northwest EMS that evening, and they came into the board meeting and got me and said, you need to talk to your son right now. He and my daughter were with Josh when he fell, and I coached them and talked with them how to take care of, how to stabilize. They were already doing everything they needed to do. And they had called 911, and I said, get them to Hershey, I'll meet you there. Because they were all at Messiah College um, they were all still in college at the time. In 2000, and, oh, let me just make another indication here. So, in the, I, it's just crazy thinking back. I met both of my, now my son in law and my daughter in law, I met both of their parents in Hershey's emergency room. And I was the one that had to tell them of the extent of injuries to their son and their daughter. In 2010, my dad remarried, happy for him. It was devastating internally to me because of everything else that was happening. I had not taken time to grieve the loss of my mother at that moment. Uh, my son gets married in 2010. My daughter gets married in 2011. We were celebrating all of that. But still, all of this that's happening in the background, right, that, that I'm sharing with you is, is just kind of nipping at my spirit. In 2012, um, our, our first granddaughter was born had a very rare birth defect that prevented her from breathing on her own, but otherwise healthy. Our business was tanking, had gotten you know, quite a bit of debt trying to keep it alive through those years of downturn. And Bobby and I had decided that if we did not there needed to be a very specific sign from God at the end of 2012 of work on the, in the schedule. Otherwise, we were closing and, and stop, stop the debt, stop everything. Um, at the same time, Sage, our granddaughter, was in Hershey um, fighting for her life. And... I got to a point that I just really didn't care if the business tanked at that moment because everything else was falling apart as well. I want you to know God provided at the 11th hour, not so much as uh, how I would have suggested it, but my accountant was in a bad vehicle accident and needed the house remodeled to for a wheelchair. That was the job I had to go to after Christmas. And we remained in business. However, at the same time, Sage died. In 2013, I was appointed the director of Racers for Christ for the Northeast region. So I I want you to know, like, I continued. Like, I just kept pushing forward. It's like, okay, God's calling me in this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pushing. But this target kept following me. 
2014, my second granddaughter is born with the same crazy birth defect after the doctor said, it's all good. Every medical test known to man at the time said, it's all good. She died. If you're a parent, you will understand this statement. One of the hardest things to go through is to watch your children suffer and be unable to do anything to make the pain better. And the absolute most painful thing I endured was watching my granddaughters die in my son's arms and unable to do anything. At the time, we literally had some... Christian friends who didn't want to be around us anymore out of fear. They were convinced there was sin in our lives and that God was chastising us for that sin. Another friend simply called me Job. Not really the persona I envisioned in 2004 when I got ordained. And at this point, I really wasn't convinced that God loved me anymore. I needed to know that God was still there, and yet he seemed silent. My prayers were shallow at best and often non-existent. My only hope was that God would see my heart and know my pain. I was experiencing the feeling of this target on my back, and I was feeling like it finally hit the heart. I took some shots, but I kept going, but I felt like this might have been the deadly shot. Can anyone here relate to this at all? I read the prayer requests that come across for this congregation. I know there's pain out there. I know people are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, grieving because loss of loved ones. And so, while I really didn't like this verse during this time, I look back on this verse and say, in James chapter 1, you probably know it, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now we read that and we go, I'm good with that. But do we know the price that that may cost to get to the other end, to the other side? Um, In the Daily Bread devotional, April 28th, the author wrote this, God will sometimes allow us to go through challenges and hardships so that he can, we can be molded into who he's called us to be. He waits in anticipation for us to come out of the trials of life, mature and complete, not lacking anything. By staying grounded in Jesus, we can persevere through any challenge, growing stronger and ultimately allowing the fruit of the Spirit to blossom in our lives. His wisdom gives us nourishment when we need to truly flourish each day. The nourishment to flourish each day. And then the word for you today, devotional, just recently, had this in it. The psalmist asked, when the foundations for good collapse, what can good people do? Then the psalmist goes on to answer his own question. The Lord sits on his throne in heaven. When sickness comes, when your marriage fails, when your children suffer, when death strikes, what are you to do? Remember that God is still on the throne and he is watching over you. No detail escapes his notice or care. He works according to a plan I would say, not my plan. (laughs) And it's not usually a plan we understand when we're going through the hard times. Only in looking back do we realize what 
that his goodness and mercy have followed us all the days of our lives. Joseph landed in prison. Moses spent 40 years in the desert. Daniel ended up in chains. These were dismal moments. Who could possibly have seen any good in them? Who could have known that Joseph the prisoner was only a single promotion away from becoming Joseph the prime minister? Who would have thought God was providing Moses 40 years of wilderness training in the same desert through which he would lead the people? Who would have imagined that Daniel, the captive, would soon become the king's counselor? God carries out his plans like that. He did it for Joseph, for Moses, and for Daniel, and he will do the same for you. So trust him, and he will give you the grace you need to get through this situation. When you ask, God, where are you? He answers, I am with you, and I will watch over you. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. We need to believe that. And I am going to tell you, that was, I didn't always believe that going through the hard times, the darkness. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The challenge for me is remaining in him during the pain. When it's deep pain that you just like, God must have it in for me because it's all stuff outside of my control, right? Um, and, and even, you know, somebody that I highly respect told me, you, you don't question God. And I, I'm here to tell you my opinion, my experiences, it's in the why and the wrestling of the why is where healing comes. Because that's where you start really looking to God and saying, what are you trying to teach me? Help me not waste the pain. Help me be a fast learner. That, that started to be my, it's like, okay, God, just teach me, get me, get me over this. You know, like, uh, uncle, I'll, I, I'll, I'll learn whatever you want me to learn. A.W. Tozer, spiritual giant, previous generation said this, before God can use a person greatly, he must allow the person to be hurt deeply. Not something we repeat to people a whole lot, is it? So here's the issue, I believe. The issue is ministry. You know, we are God's plan to save a broken world to communicate the gospel. The plan got carried out on the cross, but we are the communicators. We are the marketing team for Jesus. Does that give you a lot of confidence? The calling that God has on his disciples are two things, two essentials. One is compassion for people. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. If your extent of relationship is a wave at the door as you go in and out, ministry's not going to happen. Relationship has to go deep. It has to go below the surface where it's a safe space for us to share our pain. Not just to share it, but to have an exchange, a dialogue of conversation, of understanding. And then the second thing in ministry is you need confidence in God. Confidence that God's going to bring, either bring you through it, or if not, you're going to learn, you're going to be teachable to learn what it is that God wants you to know. And then how do I use that for him and his purposes going forward. So let's think about football for a minute. A football player who's on the team, tends all the practices, does the routines, knows the plays, 
suits up for the games and participates in the team chant in the beginning of the game and comes out and ready to rock, ready to roll, ready to just uh, take them on. But as soon as the coach puts the player in the game to gain short yardage, be the ball carrier, we just need three yards when we got a first down. And if you have watched any kind of football, you know that it's just like this massive whoo, right on top of the guy, right? And then he goes crying to the coach that they hit him. What would you think about that player? What? Okay. <laughs> or baseball. I got to thinking about that. How often do I sound that way to God? How often do we sound that way to God? Oh, he hit me. They said a nasty thing about me. And I shared what I went through in our life in that, that period. So you understand, it wasn't just light hits. It wasn't just little stuff. It was stuff that affected me to my core. And yet, in ministry, as disciples, and, and just to clarify, you're all in ministry. If you're sitting here today, if you're watching online, you're in ministry. How often do we whine and complain to God that we got hit? And he's going like, like we went over this play. You knew it was gonna, you were going to get hit. The Apostle Paul laid it out perfectly in his letters. Have you read that? Do you know about Job? Do you know about Daniel? Did you read that? Like, I tried to give you examples. This isn't flag football. After I shared what we went through, my, my, my current career now is I'm a business coach. Some of my best advice and deepest empathy comes from the lessons learned in that recession of 2009 to 2013 when I was fighting for my life in business. My authority in that comes from my pain and experience. How often does God use your, somebody else's pain to speak to you? So, do you think, do I think we should be safe from God using us in that way? But we, I think we do. I mean, I think we kind of expect that. Like, God, I'm serving you. I'm volunteering. I do all this, and I shouldn't have to go through this. For me, that pain was very real and lasted for four years in business. And I can say now that without those experiences, I would be much less effective at my job now. I use those experiences every week. And I get to, in this job, I get to travel all over our country helping people with that. In 2012, even 2013, 14, being a coach, a business coach, wasn't even on my radar. Like, I just wanted to get through this week, not even thinking about that. But God had a plan. I know that now. I knew that then. I just didn't, like, I, I, honestly, I wasn't buying into it. Like, God, I don't like this plan. So now I want to give you some reflections over that time. My son, I refer to you now as your pastor. And I believe a tremendous blessing to Kanoi. He and Carissa have adopted two children who didn't have family otherwise. And they have two foster kids 
because their family is unable to provide. My daughter I referred to is now an EMT at Northwest EMS and continues to pursue further education in EMS. And I have been around this a long time, and I will tell you, she is one of the most empathetic providers I know. My son-in-law, who is a paraplegic, is completely independent and has even finished a half Ironman competition. At the moment of those crises as we went through, I couldn't see past the crisis to what God's plan was today. None of us can. And I think it's designed that way. Because somewhere between here and here is where faith clashes with life. If everything goes the way we plan and goes well and it's just a gravy train going through. Who needs God? And where does faith even play a role? Where does faith play a part? I want to read to you. Um, so Nick has his commentators he likes. I, I have mine as well. Um, and I want to just read this one to you. It's interesting to me, this is about Paul in, the, in Acts that we read earlier about being shipwrecked on that island. It is interesting to me that although Paul prayed for everyone on the island and they were healed, he himself remained afflicted with a thorn in the flesh, which most Bible scholars believe was an eye issue and from which Paul prayed for deliverance three times. Sometimes the greatest work flows through the very areas of our lives which we ourselves struggle. For example, even though you might have a difficult marriage situation, you might find yourself with an effective ministry in helping other couples. Because the very struggles you go through give you a compassion and a sensitivity toward others in the same situation. So, we have all of this, these stories and the scripture that gives, really sets us up to be prepared that there's going to be darts flying, there's going to be bullets zinging past our head, and unfortunately, sometimes they hit. This is something that I told my kids growing up in the church, and, and I had to put it in here, is like, Christianity is not a spectator sport. If you're on the bench, go home. Get off the bench, get in the game. Being a disciple, being a follower of Christ is not a spectator sport. And discipleship is a full contact sport. Man, be prepared to get hit. Be prepared to take some bruises. And you know, I can't ever remember really consciously thinking about this through this darkness that I described, and, and I'm not proud of that, but I'm gonna tell you um, today, we need to put on the armor of God. God has equipped us, if we so choose, to take it. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 here, and this is the armor. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a whole other thing going on that we don't ever see that is influencing all this around us. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist 
the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So I don't have a shield of faith, but I have a fireproof racing jacket that is my armor in this example to shield that target, to shield my body from those arrows, from shielding Satan from getting to me. Sometimes it's not the bullets, it's what's going on in here. And then what's going on in here, okay? Unfortunately, even being in this situation was not our own doing. This started in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve gave Satan a foothold in their rebellion. There's a law of cause and effect. God gave Adam free will. And the unleashing of Satan's power was a result of Adam's choice in the garden. Fast forward to today. Recent mass shootings. Realize mankind still refuses to take responsibility for the results of evil of our choices. Does anyone here, do you all, notice that our culture seems to blame everything or everyone for, I'm sorry, seems to blame everything or everyone except for Satan or call out evil? It's everything else's fault that things are the way they are. In recent weeks following the 4th of July parade shooting or massacre, I watched a, a news panel. There was four people on the panel. They were discussing it. And one individual said, <clears throat> and I, I tried to copy it down here, um, we have to accept that there is a spirit of evil that has invaded our culture. And when I heard him say that, I'm like, whoa, that's finally and all three other panelists pushed back and said, well, I think that's kind of way out there. It's mental health, it's guns, it's legislation. In my opinion, when human beings made in God's image are randomly taking the lives of other human beings made in God's image, it's just pure evil. It's pure Satan. Getting the best of things. The enemy has infiltrated the human spirit in new ways. No amount of education or gun laws or legislation or political crap is going to fix it. We need to call out evil. We need to call out Satan. We need to put on the armor of God. And we need to go to battle. I lost my place. If Satan can convince the world he is not to blame, which I believe he's succeeding at, he keeps full access to humanity. Think about that. If he can avoid blame, meaning we all as humans don't see evil for evil and how Satan is working, he remains having full access because it's not him. It's everything else that gets blamed. Putting on the armor of God is so important and critical. We need that spiritual protection. Football players don't get to play without their safety equipment. A firefighter does not run into fire without their safety equipment. I did not strap myself into a dragster without my safety equipment. But pain in crisis can still happen. It's not a guarantee that says you are now in this protective little bubble wrap that you'll not feel pain. It just says I'm equipped. And if I fully, 
follow Christ, he's going to give me what I need at the time. My problem is I like to have control. But folks, the only solution is Jesus. I want to remind us that on that cross, or a cross, Jesus was crucified, he was dead, he was buried, he spent three days in hell and resurrected for this purpose, this reason. He cut the head off the snake at that time. And we have victory if we follow. He already won the war. It's the battle that we're in that we've got to navigate. That means I need to get done. I'll keep going. Uh, I just, I, I don't know if Nick's watching or not, but Nick, I set an alarm. <laughs> All right, so wrapping up. We can still choose what we do every day with our free will. It is the most blessed and cursed thing at the same time. I love free will. I love my independence, but man, there's a price to pay when I don't make the right choice. Jesus Christ provided the rescue for each of us personally on the cross. It's up to us to choose him. Jesus changes our perspective from defeated to victorious, from our weakest moment to our finest hour, like Paul, from victim to conqueror. God wants us to embrace our pain and allow him to use it for the redemption of others who don't deserve it either. I'm just going to say that again. God wants us to embrace our pain and allow him to use it for the redemption of others who don't deserve it either, because we don't deserve it. And yet he gave it to us by grace. Discipleship is a full contact sport. Do you have your armor on? Do you put it on? Do you consciously pray and put that armor on? daily, or going into a meeting, or going into a situation, or going into the doctor's office. It doesn't mean that we're going to come out all is healed and wonderful, but he will with, be with you in the darkness. So as I pray, and if you want to have Doug come up a while, um, as I pray, I want you to reflect and ask God what pain you are experiencing that you need to put on the armor of God. I'll come back. And what pain do you need to turn over to God? And then I invite you to lay it at the feet of Jesus. So I want you to think about, as I pray, and um, Doug, just stay there. I'm going to come back and pray for you. Just stay seated. I'm going to pray a prayer. The worship team can come up for the last song. I'm going to pray for Doug because he shared with me that this morning has been tough. Satan is working things and we just need to pray Satan back and put on the armor for Doug. Sometimes I can't lift the armor and put it on. That's where you need to come in and help me put it on, right? And that's what we're going to do for Doug. So let me pray with Doug. Yeah, anybody else that wants to come up, please do so. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.